Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is Thevenin's theorem as applied to AC circuits. We'll additionally briefly examine Norton's theorem as applied to AC circuits. Our objective is to learn to simplify a complicated AC circuit into a Thevenin's equivalent. Ideally, the original and the Thevenin's equivalent will behave identical to each other. However, the Thevenin's equivalent circuit will be notably easier to build and to solve for desired electrical quantities. Bottom line up front. AC Thevenin's theorem is DC Thevenin's theorem with phasors. I cannot make it much simpler than that. This lecture therefore operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with both Thevenin's theorem as applied to DC circuits and series parallel AC circuit analysis as illustrated in the DC Thevenin's theorem lecture and the basic electronics AC circuit analysis playlist, both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. If you recall, Thevenin's theorem as applied to DC circuits rendered even the most tangled and gnarly of series parallel circuits into tame and docile pure series circuits that sit, stay, and roll over on command. The same is true for AC circuits, the one complication being that phasor equivalents and complex impedances are employed for analysis purposes. Thevenin's theorem is a two-step procedure that simplifies a complicated circuit to a simple series circuit consisting of a Thevenin's equivalent voltage source, ETH, in series with a Thevenin's equivalent impedance, ZTH, in series with our electrical load of interest, Z load. The original complicated circuit and the Thevenin's equivalent circuit should ideally behave the same, and importantly, the load impedance should be none the wiser to the substitution. Of note is not only the substantial ease with which calculations could be made for the range of load impedances using the Thevenin equivalent circuit, after all, it's a pure series circuit, but also how much less components, connections, and confusion is involved with a physical construction of the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Which would you rather be responsible for, a complicated series parallel circuit or a simple pure series circuit with only two elements? I know which one I'd prefer. As a demonstration of the utility of Thevenin's theorem, consider the following series parallel circuit consisting of a 120 volt, 60 hertz AC voltage source and four elements a 270 ohm resistor, a non-ideal 240 millihenry inductor that happens to have 10 ohms of internal resistance, a 6.8 microfarad capacitor, and a variable load impedance, Z load, currently set to 200 ohms at an angle of 20 degrees hooked in the following fashion. We're being asked to determine the anticipated voltage across the load, V load, and the current through the load, I load. Without the use of Thevenin's theorem, we need to resort to time-consuming series parallel circuit analysis. If you're up to the challenge, by all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. Again, we're looking for the voltage across and the current through the single load impedance only and nothing else. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 270 ohm resistor is 270 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. Complex impedance of the resistive portion of the non ideal inductor will be 10 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. Let's call this impedance ZR. The complex impedance of the inductive portion of the non ideal 240 millihenry inductor at an excitation frequency of 60 Hz will be 90.5 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance ZL. The resistive and inductive portion of the non ideal inductor are in series with one another. The non ideal inductor therefore presents a complex impedance of 91 ohms at an angle of 83.7 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Finally, the complex impedance of the 6.8 microfarad capacitor at an excitation frequency of 60 Hz is 390.1 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z3. Before we start plugging additional numbers into our calculators, let's come up with a plan of attack. Often complicated series parallel circuits can be simplified into pure series or pure parallel equivalents and then pure series or pure parallel properties can be applied to these simplifications. Once properties within these simplifications are solved for, all one needs to do is to map these properties back to the original series parallel circuit. A necessary first step for this procedure is to apply both Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law to the series parallel circuit in question to examine voltage and current distribution within it. Our Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this circuit illustrates that source current must travel through impedance element 1. Then it splits into two paths, a portion of which goes through impedance element Z3, 
and the other portion of which goes through the series combination of impedance element Z2 and our load impedance Z load. Let's call this path I single prime, where I single prime is the current through impedance element 2, which is also the current through our load impedance. Our Kirchhoff's current law equations demonstrates that source current equals current through impedance element 1, which equals the summation of I3 plus I single prime, where I single prime equals I2 equals I load. This KCL analysis implies that impedance element Z2 is in series with our load impedance Z load, a simplification I'm calling Z single prime. This additionally implies that combined impedance Z single prime is in parallel with impedance element Z3, a simplification I'm calling Z double prime. Our load impedance Z load is internal to Z single prime, which is in turn internal to Z double prime. Let's now examine voltage distribution within this circuit. A Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this first loop in red indicates that E equals V1 plus V2 plus voltage across our load impedance. A Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this second loop in orange indicates E equals V1 plus V3. Finally, a Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this third loop in yellow indicates V3 equals V2 plus voltage across our load impedance. These analyses again support our earlier conclusion that Z2 is in series with Z load, a simplification I'm calling Z single prime, and combined impedance Z single prime is in parallel with impedance element Z3, a simplification I'm calling Z double prime, where combined impedance Z double prime is in series with impedance element Z1. Again, our load impedance is internal to Z single prime, which is internal to Z double prime. Let's now perform an analysis of these much simpler circuits, then map these properties back to our original series parallel circuit. Z2 and Z load taken in series present a complex impedance of approximately 253.8 ohms at an angle of 38.8 degrees. Z3 and Z single prime taken in parallel present a complex impedance of 325.3 ohms at an angle of negative 1.8 degrees. There are several ways to obtain our desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of two applications of the voltage divider rule followed by a subsequent Ohm's law analysis. An application of the voltage divider rule on our last simplification suggests that the voltage across combined impedance Z double prime equals 65.6 volts at an angle of negative 0.8 degrees. Given combined impedance Z double prime is the parallel combination of Z3 and Z single prime, it can be stated that V double prime equals V3, which equals V single prime. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. Given combined impedance Z single prime is a series combination of Z2 and our load impedance Z load, we can now examine voltage distribution within this series branch. An application of the AC voltage divider rule suggests voltage across our load to be 51.7 volts at an angle of negative 19.6 degrees. Finally, Ohm's law suggests that current through Z load equals 258.3 milliampers at an angle of negative 39.5 degrees. Without the use of Thevenin's theorem, this necessitated a lengthy series parallel circuit analysis. Despite the complications, we did solve for voltage across and the current through our load impedance. Or did we? I'm super sorry to say I just discovered an error in my previous calculations. Z load is supposed to be an impedance of 300 ohms at an angle of negative 15 degrees. Sorry about that. This means our earlier calculation for Z single prime is wrong, as is our calculation for Z double prime, as is our first voltage divider rule, our second voltage divider rule, and our application of Ohm's law. I hate to have to say this, but let's pause the lecture and recalculate all the values. Again, don't skip this step because it's vitally important to our later discussion. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. I do not know what's going on today. I'm totally hosing up this lecture. Z load isn't supposed to be 300 ohms at an angle of negative 15 degrees. I mean, Z load is supposed to be 300 ohms at an angle of positive 15 degrees. You can see the mistake, can't you? Go off and calculate these values. While you're at it, calculate the values for Z load at 100 ohms at an angle of negative 15 degrees, 300 ohms at an angle of negative 15 degrees, 300 ohms at an angle of positive 15 degrees, 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees, 195.9 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees, and 195.9 ohms at an angle of 10.6 degrees. I'll wait for you, and I'll wait a long, long, long time. 
Do you see the point I'm driving at? Every time Z load changes, you change the whole damn circuit and it necessitates another complete series parallel circuit analysis. This is a serious drag and there has got to be a better way. The better way is with Thevenin's theorem. Thevenin's theorem is a two-step procedure that simplifies a complicated circuit into a simple series circuit. The original complicated circuit and the Thevenin's equivalent should ideally behave the same, and importantly, the load impedance should be none the wiser to the substitution. Of note is not only the substantial ease with which calculations can be made using the Thevenin equivalent circuit, but also how much less components, connections, and confusion is involved with the physical construction of the Thevenin's equivalent circuit. The two steps in Thevenin's theorem necessitate a shift in perspective from the source to the load. Customarily, we've been performing circuit analysis as if the source is the one controlling the show. However, the source is really only part of the picture. Ohm's law supports this duality. Voltage influences current directly. Increased voltage magnitude, current magnitude increases. Impedance, however, influences current inversely. Decrease the impedance, current magnitude increases. Both partners are necessary for the dance. Thevenin's theorem takes advantage of this half of the equation. How does our variable load impedance see our circuit? The Thevenin's equivalent circuit consists of a single AC voltage source called ETH in series with a single impedance, ZTH, in series with our variable load impedance Z load. To simplify a complicated circuit into its Thevenin's equivalent, we need to solve for these two quantities, ETH and ZTH. Let's start by discussing the procedure necessary to solve for ETH, the Thevenin's equivalent voltage. First, one must remove the load impedance from the nodes of interest. Next, one simply determines the open circuit voltage seen across these two nodes of interest. Note the removal of the load impedance may fundamentally alter the nature of the original series parallel circuit, as we'll demonstrate in a moment. Solving for our Thevenin's equivalent impedance, ZTH, also necessitates removal of the load impedance. Additionally, one must also remove the source, or sources, from consideration. One removes a voltage source by replacing it with a short. One removes a current source by replacing it with an open. Make note that incorporating shorts and opens inside your original circuit may fundamentally alter the nature of your circuit, as we'll see in a moment. Finally, one determines the impedance of this modified circuit at the terminals of interest. Make note that ZTH is not the impedance seen by the original source. ZTH is the impedance seen at the load terminals of interest when the source has been removed. This shift in perspective may fundamentally alter the nature of this original circuit. Let's apply Thevenin's theorem to our original series parallel circuit. Let's first determine the Thevenin's equivalent voltage. Let's start by removing our variable load impedance C load. Now we need to determine the open circuit voltage seen across these two nodes of interest. In this case, the removal of the load impedance prevents any current traveling through impedance Z2. All current will travel through the series combination of Z1 and Z3. Given no current travels through impedance Z2, there will be no voltage drop across it, and we can consider this circuit as a purely series arrangement of Z1 and Z3. By removing the load impedance, impedance Z2 has been effectively removed from consideration. The open circuit voltage of interest is therefore the voltage across impedance Z3, where impedance element Z1 is in series with Z3. Again, removal of the load impedance has fundamentally altered the nature of the original series parallel circuit. An application of the AC voltage divider rule solving for V3 yields 98.7 volts at an angle of negative 34.7 degrees. This is our Thevenin's equivalent voltage, ETH. Let's set these calculations aside and move on to solve for ZTH, the Thevenin's equivalent impedance. In this example, we've designated Z load as our impedance of interest. As previously discussed, any change in Z load would necessitate a complete series parallel circuit analysis to solve for desired quantities. Let's determine the Thevenin's equivalent impedance seen by Z load. Let's start by removing Z load. Let's now remove the source by replacing it with a short or a zero ohm impedance path. Now we need to determine the impedance at the nodes of interest. 
Again, make note that the Thevenin's equivalent impedance is not the impedance seen by the original source. ZTH is the impedance seen by any load impedance when the source has been removed. If you want to, you can even draw yourself a little ohmmeter on the terminals of interest to remind you that perspective has shifted. In this circuit, any ohmmeter sensing current must travel through impedance element Z2, and then it splits between two paths offered by impedance element Z1 and Z3. Using this new perspective, impedance Z1 is clearly in parallel with impedance Z3, and this parallel combination of elements is in series with impedance element Z2. The parallel combination of Z1 and Z3 present an impedance of 220 ohms at an angle of negative 34.7 degrees. Let's call this simplification Z single prime. Z single prime taken in series with impedance element Z2, this modified circuit presents an impedance of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees. This is our Thevenin's equivalent impedance, ZTH. Let's discuss what just happened. Note, solving for the Thevenin's equivalent voltage had nothing to do with solving for the Thevenin's equivalent impedance. And conversely, solving for the Thevenin's equivalent impedance had nothing to do with solving for the Thevenin's equivalent voltage. There is an impenetrable brick wall between these two properties, and they can be solved for in the order of your choosing. The Thevenin's equivalent voltage and Thevenin's equivalent impedance only come together in the final step. Our Thevenin's equivalent circuit is therefore the series combination of ETH at 98.7 volts at an angle of negative 34.7 degrees and ZTH at 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees. If everything I've been telling you is true, this Thevenin equivalent circuit should behave exactly the same as our original circuit and the variable load impedance should be none the wiser to the substitution. Let's see if this is the case. Recall our original series parallel circuit analysis employed a load impedance of 200 ohms at an angle of 20 degrees. Solving for voltage across the load and current through it necessitated a lengthy series parallel circuit analysis. Using the Thevenin's equivalent circuit, we're presented with a far more workable solution. In the occasion when Z load is 200 ohms at an angle of 20 degrees, an application of the voltage divider rule suggests voltage across the load is 51.7 volts at an angle of negative 19.6 degrees. A subsequent application of Ohm's law suggests current through Z load equals 258.3 milliampers at an angle of negative 39.6 degrees. O M G. These are the same results we obtained using series parallel circuit analysis. Only the Thevenin's equivalent circuit necessitated far less effort, far less time, far less confusion, and far less tears. That's the point. The Thevenin's equivalent is a much simpler circuit, yet it yields the same results. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for the voltage across the load and the current through the load impedance for any of the following conditions. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. To keep this lecture short, let's just analyze one scenario. In the occasion when the variable load is adjusted to 300 ohms at an angle of negative 15 degrees, an application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates voltage across the load to be 59.7 volts at an angle of negative 36.4 degrees. A subsequent application of Ohm's law demonstrates current through the load to be 199.1 milliampers at an angle of negative 21.4 degrees. Use of the Thevenin's equivalent circuit for this range of load impedances is simple application of very basic series properties. Despite the repetitive nature of this analysis for this range of load values, it's far easier using the Thevenin's equivalent circuit than performing six different complicated series parallel circuit analyses for the same load conditions. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let's briefly discuss building the Thevenin equivalent circuit for purposes of experimental verification in the lab. It should be pretty simple, right? It's just a series combination of two elements. Not really. As proof of the somewhat more involved fabrication of this circuit, I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture and go get me a 98.7 volt sinusoidal voltage source with a phase shift of negative 34.7 degrees. While you're at it, Go get me a complex impedance of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees from the stockroom. Don't worry, I'll wait for you.
The point being that there is no such thing as a 98.7 volt source with a phase shift of negative 34.7 degrees and a complex impedance of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees. Elements necessary for the construction of Thevenin equivalent circuits don't ordinarily exist as commercially available products and necessitate a bit of work on your part to build them from scratch. Let's deal with the Thevenin's equivalent voltage source first. Yes, one could easily create a sinusoidal voltage waveform with a frequency of 60 Hz and an RMS value of 98.7 volts using a generic function generator. But how do you give it a negative 34.7 degree phase shift? Well, you can't. Recall that phase shift is simply a means of relating one waveform to another. Phase shift only means something if you're comparing it with something. If, however, we consider our Thevenin's equivalent circuit in isolation, we are safe to assume that Thevenin's equivalent voltage source is our reference. We can swap out our original as calculated Thevenin's equivalent voltage source with one having a value of 98.7 volts at an angle of zero degrees. In fact, we've re-referenced, if re-referencing is a real word, our earlier calculated values by shifting our whole plane of analysis by 34.7 degrees. How will this across the board shift affect experimentally obtained voltage and current observations for different load conditions? The answer is, it won't. Yes, by re-referencing our Thevenin's equivalent voltage source, we've shifted our whole plane of analysis, but think about it. When has absolute referencing ever been important? Recall for power calculations, only relative phase shift between voltage and current matters. Consider our earlier calculations when the load impedance is at 200 ohms at an angle of 20 degrees. Our previous calculations suggest using the original series parallel circuit or the Thevenin's equivalent voltage source and employing an antiquated absolute reference of negative 34.7 degrees, suggested voltage across the load will be 51.7 volts at an angle of negative 19.6 degrees and current through this load will be 258.3 milliamperes at an angle of negative 39.6 degrees. Despite use of an absolute reference, it should be evident that current through the load lags voltage across it by a relative 20 degrees. For the purposes of AC power calculation, only relative phase shift matters. The application of the AC power formula employing only this relative shift between voltage and current suggests the load experiences roughly 13.4 volt amperes of apparent power of which 12.5 watts is directed towards real power and 4.6 vars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's now examine the less than earth shattering implications of assuming our Thevenin's equivalent voltage source is considered our reference. Application of the AC voltage divider rule suggests voltage across our load will be 51.7 volts at an angle of 15.1 degrees. Subsequent application of Ohm's law suggests that current through the load will be 258.3 milliamperes at an angle of negative 4.9 degrees. O, M, G. Voltage and current have the same magnitude as our previous calculations, and O, M, G squared, current still appears to lag voltage by a relative 20 degrees. An application of the AC power formula employing only the relative phase shift between voltage and current suggests that the load experiences roughly 13.4 volt amperes of apparent power of which 12.5 watts is directed towards real power and 4.6 bars is directed towards a reactive interchange. In summary, absolute references mean absolutely nothing. This load would experience the same amount of power whether you used the old reference, assumed a new reference, or put it in a round room and asked it to pee in a corner. If you're just doing theoretical calculations for the purposes of a homework, worksheet, quiz, or an exam, it's probably easier to just use the old reference. If, however, you're actually building the Thevenin's equivalent circuit in real life in a lab with real world components, it's probably easier to assume the single voltage source you're actually using is your reference. Let's now examine the real world complications regarding the Thevenin's equivalent impedance. Obviously, there's no such thing as a complex impedance of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees on the shelf of the complex impedance store downtown. There are, however, resistive and reactive elements that when connected in a series fashion can present a complex impedance of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees. 
given our desired Thevenin's equivalent impedance has a small negative value, we're most likely dealing with a resistor in series with a capacitor. Resolving the Thevenin's equivalent impedance expressed in polar format into rectangular format demonstrates the series summation of a resistive and reactive component with a value of 192.5 minus J35.9. This implies our Thevenin's equivalent impedance is the series combination of a 192.5 ohm resistor and a capacitor that happens to have an impedance magnitude of 35.9 ohms at our given excitation frequency of 60 Hz. An algebraic rearrangement of the capacitive complex impedance formula to solve for capacitance yields a capacitance value of roughly 73.9 microfarads. These two elements in series act as our Thevenin's equivalent impedance ZTH at the given excitation frequency. In summary, all we need to do to create our Thevenin's equivalent circuit is to set up a function generator to supply a 60 Hz sinusoidal AC waveform with an RMS value of 98.7 volts and place a 192.5 ohm resistor in series with a 73.9 microfarad capacitor. This Thevenin's equivalent circuit would perform identical to our previous series parallel circuit with a notable advantage that it's far easier to build and solve for the desired properties. Finally, before we bring this lecture to a close, allow me to briefly comment on Norton's theorem as applied to AC circuits. Norton's theorem, similar to Thevenin's theorem, can also be used to simplify a complicated AC circuit. The notable difference being that the Norton's equivalent circuit consists of a current source in parallel with the Norton's equivalent impedance and a variable load impedance. Yes, there are separate techniques one can use to directly derive the Norton's equivalent circuit. However, I find it much easier to simply determine the Thevenin's equivalent circuit and then do a simple source conversion if one is ever asked to determine the Norton's equivalent circuit. For our example circuit, a source conversion yields a Norton equivalent sinusoidal AC current source IN with a value of 503.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 24.1 degrees in parallel with a Norton's equivalent impedance ZN of 195.9 ohms at an angle of negative 10.6 degrees. You'll note the original series parallel circuit, the Thevenin's equivalent, and this new Norton's equivalent should all behave identically to each other. However, the Thevenin's equivalent and Norton equivalent circuits will be notably easier to build and solve for desired electrical quantities. Don't make Norton's theorem hard. Apply Thevenin's theorem, do a source conversion, call it good. All right. Let's bring this lecture to a close. For those seeking additional guidance on this topic, rest easy. There's another complete lecture featuring solely illustrated examples of Thevenin's theorem with your name on it. In conclusion, we learned to employ Thevenin's theorem in AC circuit analysis. We learned to simplify a complicated series parallel circuit into its Thevenin's equivalent circuit, consisting of a Thevenin's equivalent voltage source, ETH, in series with a Thevenin's equivalent impedance, ZTH, in series with a variable electrical load impedance. We demonstrated the original and the Thevenin's equivalent circuit behave identical to each other. However, the Thevenin's equivalent is notably easier to build and solve for desired electrical quantities. Finally, we discussed the practical nature of the Thevenin's equivalent circuit in a lab environment, and we'll quickly discuss Norton's equivalent circuits, where the Norton's equivalent can be quickly derived from the Thevenin's equivalent using a simple source conversion. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.